and you and I'm letting people in admit all whenever you're ready to start and you and I'm letting people in admit all all right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's forum. And I'm here with you on this afternoon on behalf of the Podium Progressive Perspectives along with Temple University and a lot of other co-sponsors which I will mention later on in the program. But now we're gonna have our greeting and welcome by Dr. Marie K. Asante, who is the chair of the Department of Psychology at Temple University. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the, uh, uh, everyone to mute their microphone. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, in the name of uh, uh, Amen and Atun and uh, Pata and Ra. Uh, I come to you and greet you. Uh, in their names, in the names of all of the divinities uh, from throughout the African continent. Let me know. Let me know if you have to to say to you. Uh, I greet you in the name of all the ancestors and all the divinities of the African continent, and also the Almighty. Uh, Amen. Aton. Pata and Ra. This is a wonderful occasion, and I am delighted as the chair of the Department of Africology and African American Studies at Temple University uh, to greet you and to welcome you uh, and to be a partner uh, with the uh, partnerships that we have at our department with uh, people in Guyana as well as in Brazil. Haiti. Uh, this is a remarkable day because uh, we have one of the great scholars of the contemporary times uh, giving a talk, a presentation uh, on ancient African spirituality, uh, showing and demonstrating the roots uh, for voodoo and early Christianity. Uh, uh, Dr. Kemani Nehusi, uh, has established himself as one of our leading uh, scholars in ancient Egyptian history and culture. Uh, in fact, uh, he has a PhD from uh, University College, uh, University of London. Uh, he is, uh, he's been a senior lecturer at uh, the University of East London. Uh, he has been, and we are so grateful, a uh, associate professor for us for a long time. And we are eager to uh, select, uh, we have eagerly selected him uh, to uh, uh, be a professor. We are pushing him forward. Uh, he should have been a professor a long time ago. He's published a, a number of books and over 70 publications. He's a brilliant scholar, a man of uh, great disposition, and I first came and recognized him in a film that was being made by Owen Shahada and my son, M.K. Asante, called 500 Years Later. And I wanted to know from them, who is this guy? Uh, because he was so uh, sharp and keen as he's always been. So on behalf of his colleagues in the Department of Africology, and African American Studies at Temple, on behalf of all of his students, including uh, Jasmine Evans and others, uh, I am very happy to be here. And thank you so much uh, for allowing me to say these few words. Uh, 
I think that uh, 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 Cindy Peters must be uh, unmute herself. You are correct. That is that I was muted. But thank you so much for those wonderful words of welcome and greetings from your department and the support system that supports Dr. Nancy on this journey on today. Thank you for the introduction in terms of his extensive career in this field and the work that he does at Temple University and throughout the different spaces and, and information about his publications. So we are so eager to hear from him on today. Next, we will have a libation by Mambo Selit. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Carlene Wilkinson here from the University of Guyana. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce Mambo Selide. Can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Good. Mambo Selide is a Haitian priestess born in Haiti. At three years old, her parents decided to send her to Canada where she lived over 40 years. Mother of four, she is an international consultant in business development and management. Known as Marie Eleonard Beatrice Dalius, being raised in a Catholic boarding school did not prevent her for, from going back to her roots. The ancestors' callings brought her to be also initiate in Benin Vodou as a Mamiwata and Dan priestess to the elevated rank of Her Majesty Tognonsi. Recently appointed Supontif for the Afro-descendants of the Caribbean and French islands, Mambo Selide is the representative of His Eminence Dagbo Unon Tomadile Hupon II, who are Menu, world supreme chef of Vodou and indigenous traditions. Mambo Selide offers guidance throughout the journey of identity reconnection. I would ask now Mambo to do her invocation for us. Please, please unmute Mambo. Please unmute your mic. Pa pouvoir papa loko a tisou, ki ba nou pouvoir pou recevoir et pi partager parole sacré divinité yo. Bear with us momentarily. We know how technology is engaging with us on these days especially when we're dealing with spirituality. Our energies, our high energies, sometimes interrupt the flow. So let's give Sister Salide a few seconds or a few minutes. Well, while we wait, I would want to interject here and, you know, just speak a little bit about the partners that we do have on today. Um, as we were advertising this event, we mentioned that the Haitian Cultural Society is also a co-sponsor of today's event, the Federation of Caribbean Culture Associations, um, the African Studies Research Group of the University of Guyana, and the Department of Africology, of course, and Africana Studies, African American Studies, my, um, my bad, at Temple University. And of course, nonetheless, Korean Progressive Perspectives. And we wanna think about spirituality in a holistic way. Um, we 
usually speak about a, a few challenges in the world and specifically geared towards the Caribbean on this platform. And today we're really delving into another element of our society, our spirituality, which is really the of humanity, you know, how we guide ourselves as, as individuals, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, and which is also a very important element of liberation and, and struggle. So um, we are so excited to hear from Brother Kimani on today. Well, I believe that we are still having some technical difficulties with our libation. And in, with that said, I think we will move on and we'll bless this event in our own special way. Let's just log back in. Okay, I'll give her a few seconds. So let's see what happened. Apparently we are now connected. I don't know what you heard from the start of the libation. Greetings to all and blessings. If you don't mind, I will just try to redo it. I guess we have a lot of energies. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sure. Go ahead. Qui bat nous intelligence pour comprendre science la vie. Hein? Avec permission à Tibon Legba, qui l'ouvre chemin pour nous apprendre à recevoir loi et avec l'esprit en cette yo. Pas pouvoir papa loko à Tissou, qui bat nous pouvoir pour recevoir et partager parole sacrée dans cette yo. Moi dis nous, aïe bobo, aïe bobo, aïe bobo. Ashe, thank you so much. Ashe. Now we will have the person of the hour in Dr. Kimani Nesu. I will not go into in depth in terms of introducing him uh, because that Dr. Asante did that very well. And we are just excited to hear him on his talk on today about ancient African spirituality, the common root of Wudun and Euro-Christianity. So Dr. Nesu, please go ahead and enlighten us on today. Good day, good evening, good afternoon. Greetings to everyone. I hope you're hearing me clearly. Yes, we um, are. God. Um, when I said that I'm going to do this lecture, I didn't realize what a tremendous task I had put myself up for. And it's when I started thinking about it, I realized the great depth and width of what I had challenged myself to talk about. That's one way of saying that there are limitations on what we could do today. This information is so much, so deep, that it's not possible to explore all of it in one go. That's the first thing I want to say in terms of locating ourselves. Here's something else. We're talking about the cradle of all the cradles, if there are other such things, of civilization. We're talking about the beginning of humanity in speaking about African spirituality. And it's important for us to keep remembering that. So while we have those things in our mind, let me introduce ourselves, bearing um, also in mind our current situation and ask our ancestors once again to speak, not only to bless this occasion as Mambo Saliti has already invoked, but also for us to recall some of the wisdom they have given to us. So I begin with two observations, wisdom things from our ancestors. The first one is this, the beginning of wisdom is knowing who you are. The beginning of wisdom is knowing who you are. If we think about it, and especially 
upon this question that we're debating, we're, we're checking out today. If you don't know yourself, you really don't know anything. You possess pieces of knowledge, but the real meaning of your knowledge, of the information you have, will escape you. That's why so many of us are packed up with knowledge, plenty degrees, but we do not serve our people's purposes. The next one is this. If you know the beginning well, the end will not trouble you. If you know the beginning well, the end will not trouble you. And that's why in terms of orienting ourselves, I think it's important for us to remember that although ancient Egypt, Kemet, has ridden, risen in the understanding and certainly on the horizon of many of us, and that's a very, very good thing, we need to remember that ancient Egypt was not the beginning of Africa and of humanity. Ancient Egypt was the most celebrated, the most well-known flower from the African tree, but it is not the only bloom from that tree. And long before Kush and Tasseti and other civilizations in Africa, African people had initiated humanity. We need to remember that. Humanity was born black under a tropical sky in Africa. And we're going to retrace our steps to the beginnings of humanity, to the San, the Embuti, the Koishan, the Twa, and other groups of Africans who stand at the beginning of humanity. They migrated from inner Africa towards Kemet. And that's why some of the divinities, the oldest divinities of Kemet, like Bess or Puta, have the features of those forced African people, short, sometimes thicker, sometimes very thin. We're gonna come back to something that Puta has in his hands at another point in time. But I want to challenge us with this. Do you know this woman? Do you know this man? Well, this woman is had said so. A woman who became Pera, Pharaoh, ruler of Kemet at its height. I challenge us with these images because these people could walk into our classrooms, our communities, could smile at us and say hello, and we wouldn't recognize them as ancestors of that particular, or these kinds of distinctions. The reason for this is simple, they're us. And sometimes when we think about the great shapers of humanity, the initiators and the shapers of humanity, we could forget that we are talking about ourselves in this most profound way. So as we go along, let us remember this. It was not only human beings who migrated from inner Africa, from the heart of Africa, where humanity was born. They didn't migrate without their culture. They took their ideas with them too. 
And many of the ideas that we see in Kemet, ancient Egypt, many of which were transferred into Judaism and Christianity, were ideas that came from deep in the heart of Africa. Sometimes they were developed, we might say, changed to local situations. But African people have retained these ideas, the fundamental ideas, wherever we are. And sometimes it's amazing how consistent we have remained for such a long time in such diverse places that we have gone or were taken to. And when we contemplate our attempts to retain ourselves in the teeth of the greatest catastrophe ever to face humanity. I'm talking about the Ma'afa, the Arab and European invasion and oppression of Africa and its peoples, wherever we are. I think it's important for us to recognize not only how much we have retained, but how much we have contributed to other people. Today's lecture will focus primarily on the relationship between two contemporary expressions of African inheritances, one directly, one indirectly. We're talking about voodoo and Christianity. One by a group of people, Africans in Haiti, who insisted in being African and made a revolution in the name of African humanity. Another group of people who abused, prostituted the spiritual inheritance they got from African people as Christianity and committed some of the biggest crimes in human history in the name of that religion. I hope to begin to tease out some of the major points and then open up for a discussion. Let me just say though, that our ancestors, African people, did not practice religion. Our ancestors practiced spirituality. And it's important that we recognize the distinction between the two. And one way in which we could do that is by defining spirituality as well as religion. Well, what's spirituality? Rasta people and all the people say, everything is everything. And sometimes we dismiss that statement, but it's of profound importance because our ancestors know that everything is connected to everything else because they and we are all creators, sorry, have, are all the creations of the creator. We call the creator God, Uta, there are many names for the creator. The universe is an interconnected universe. And we're going to see later on that the breath of life, Ashe, and to many, many names are given for the life force that exists in all beings and things and connect us to the creator. Consequences of that are tremendous. And I only want to drum up environmentalism here. It's important that we see environmentalism as a practical application, a living application of this understanding in the life of African people and some other people too. Africans understood that 
So have any aspect of the environment, of our reality in disrepair for too long endangers the entire environment and so on for up to the universe. So Africans were practicing, were living environmentalism each day. Recently, some other people who have abused Mother Earth and endanger the entire planet have said that they discovered environmentalism. And when I look at programs about environmentalism in Africa on the television, I mean television, I'm amazed that Europeans are the one talking about environmentalism and Africans, if they're present, are always in the background. These are some of the consequences of what has happened in the journey of people through spaces and times in more recent times. So here is what I call the divine cosmic order, the way in which our ancestors understood reality that the creator, God, is at the beginning. Then there are two aspects of reality, two basic aspects, the spirit world or the unseen world and the seen world or natural world. And there are different categories of beings and things in each one of them. But note that human beings are both spiritual and natural. They're both in the seen world as well as in the unseen world. And when we talk about Christianity and Voodoo, we see that certain understandings of humanity are rooted in these understandings, in this order. Now, one of the things that we notice in both Voodoo and Christianity is the divine model of the family. And that has been represented as the Trinity. I think it's important that I show you some images of this in Kemet, ancient Egypt, before we go into just a brief discussion of what it is. Here we have you would know um, these three as um, Arsir, Arset, and uh, Heru. Some people, well, Greeks, have, as they have done, have renamed these ancestors. I'm not going to give you the Greek names. I'm going to remain with the ancestral names, the proper names. I want you to understand that this guy, Osir, is holding two important staffs. One, this one here, is the Heka. And this announces a duty to protect, pastoral protection. You're going to see this later on because this comes up in Christianity. Jesus holds the staff. Even the designation as the shepherd of the sheep comes from Kemet, ancient Egypt. This staff here is a fly whisk and it's carried by rulers in Africa today, up to this day. Aser has Heru, the child, on her knees. This is the original family 
the model of the family. Of course, in Africa, this is the beginning of that model because the, the family would expand and contract. You'll have all kinds of people, blood as well as non-blood relatives. And I do mean that. Joining the family, leaving, coming back, other people coming and so on. So please let us remember that this is not the family at its fullest extent, but this is the beginning. There are all kinds of symbolisms here. Let me give you just one more. In the ancient Egyptian language, this figure, the child, usually with a thumb and smout, and sometimes with a lock, a side lock, is used to designate words for child and childhood and so on. And this um, figure announces um, a gender that is non-specific. It's neither male nor female. But about that, more about that later on if we come to it. Here again, we have Osset and the figure of the child. Again, same thing. This is in Europe. You could see the transition. Here it's in Africa, long before Europe. Here is in Europe. But the first European representations of these were African people. So it's important to see that. Again, you have the, the Trinity there. Here, again, in Kemet, ancient Egypt, and you see again pastoral protection. Same thing. But we go here and we see the same figure deep in Africa. And you see these figures in different parts of Africa today. The point I'm making is that the mother and child, virgin and child, um, the Trinity, father, mother, and child is native to Africa, not merely to Kemet, but to other parts of Africa. And that's why we could present an image like this. We tend to know one of them, but we tend not to know where this image comes from. And we tend not to recognize how it has been changed. Lots of people would say distorted. Because as our brother um, Muta Baruka has told us, from man, woman, and child, in the dominant representations, of this trinity, it's a man, well, two men, father, son, and a spirit. The woman has been banished from this trinity. And this is consistent with the oppression of women that is germane to the dominant culture in Western society today. We could discuss that if you want to. Now, I've put this up, and many of us would recognize this um, immediately, because this is a page from a text that is extremely important in understanding where Christianity would begin to branch out from African spirituality. But before I begin this explanation, let me finish something I started, which is the definition of religion. We talked about, or at least I did, um, speak about the definition of spirituality which is an awareness of our connection and interconnection to all beings and things and living that awareness. Religion is something different. It's organized, it has a hierarchy and basically a set of rules 
And the history of religion has substantially, though not only, but substantially been an abuse of the occasion by people. If we look at the religion we're talking about today, Christianity, we're going to see some things that are frightening. Christianity was intimately involved in the perpetual wars that define Europe before it started to go abroad to conquer other peoples. And many of the conquests, almost all of them, that introduced colonialism and other forms of oppression by Europeans was done in the name of Christianity. Let me challenge all of us to recognize that in the midst of enslaving African people, this was what was pumped into us. Think about what happened on the plantations. The nastiest things you could talk about, rapes at will, children, anybody. It was done in the name of this religion. That is when it was introduced to us. So we need to have important questions about this. Now, step back a bit. Here we have on a representation of the book of Pret M. Heru, the some European scholars translate this as the book of coming forth by day, but I um, posit that this is a very, very elementary, a primitive translation. It's the book of obtaining righteousness or something like that. Um, a lot of that does, um, has to do with the term heru, which um, is read as day, or usually it's read as day or light or um, something of the sort. In this position, it must be, it cannot be day, it has to be righteousness because of the ritual context in which this book is, is written. And we have some profound uh, very, very profound um, concepts in this scene. Here we have the spirit of the departed and the spirit is always dressed in white. And that's where you get the halo and certain other things in Christianity. Here you have the divinity who rules between the living and the dead. And you notice that you have the ankh of life here. This is Impu or Anpu. The Greeks give him another name. The heart, meaning the consciousness and the seat of morality of the deceased is being weighed on a scale against a feather. This is the feather of Ma'at, truth, righteousness, justice, balance, and a number of other things. Now, let's pause to recognize that here in ancient Egypt, thousands of years ago, you have a scale. This is thousands of years before Archimedes is going to decide that he, was in, he would invent it, according to dominant sources. So here you have Jehuti, who is recording what's going on. In other words, this guy is writing history. This is long before Herodotus, who is profited or puffered by certain people as the father of history. And of course, you have Heru, who is introducing the spirit of the deceased who has passed the test, the weighing of the heart, so, Wasir, Osir, the, the ruler of the underworld. There are lots of things to talk about here, but this is during the time when the 40 
declarations of innocence would be made. This person whose conscience is being weighed is going to say, I have not done so, I have not done this, I have not done that, and so on and so forth. This is significant because Moses would take this later on and praise them into the Ten Commandments. Let me re-emphasize that in this ancient, very, very ancient African spiritual representation, you have judgment day, the wing of the heart, you have commandments, the rules, 42 declarations of innocence, you have a scale, you have the idea of life after death, and many other of the cornerstone of Christianity and voodoo right here. And we know that Moses, who went to school and university in Kemet, ancient Egypt, would give this kind of spiritual knowledge to the Jews, and it would become Judaism. And from the Jews, it would go to the people who call themselves Christians. And these ideas were passed on in this way. Now, let's be clear. I don't have anything against people inheriting ideas and practices from others. But the moment you say that you didn't get them from those people and turn around and disparage the very people who you inherit ideas from, something is morally wrong, desperately wrong with that picture. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to understand the common origins of voodoo and Christianity in African spirituality. It is of the greatest importance that African people in particular, but everybody else, understand the history of this world because a lot of us have been given false information, and we make assumptions about ourselves and other people that are not merely incorrect, but are often very, very damaging. Today, in parts of the African world, where people have been imprisoned, and I do mean that word, by certain versions of what is called Christianity, they're busy disparaging their own inheritances, including physical objects, calling them evil and that kind of thing. So in the words of somebody else, we have become our own oppressors because our minds have been imprisoned by people who benefited from our spiritual inheritance, but then use that to do evil things against us. I want to stop here for one moment and emphasize that the possession and the repossession of these pieces of knowledge, this information in IET has been of tremendous significance. I'm coming to this lecture after one done by Dr. Nigel Westmus on the revolution in IT. And I think this is a correct time to remind us that a revolution has ideas behind it, to guide it. And that the ideas that were supreme in terms of making the revolution in IT were ideas that we are discussing now, voodoo. And the reason why certain forces have found it necessary to disparage voodoo is precisely because of its potency in liberating African people. That's one clear example that when we retain our understanding of who we are, 
it's difficult or impossible to oppress us forever. And the significance of this for Candomblé, Santiera, for Risha, or any other African variety of spirituality should not escape us. Many of the things we're talking about this afternoon are also resident in those other varieties of African spirituality. And it's important that as we continue, we pause to recognize them. Now, the nature of the creator is something else that connects us to ancient African spirituality, as well as to Vodou. It's not so much found in Christianity. Here I refer to the fact that in our people's understanding of this, the creator is both male and female. We have that in Vodou. In Christianity, the creator is a he. This again is consistent with male dominance in European culture. The religion has been made to reflect the culture. Also important is the arrangement and the relationship between the creator and other divinities Usually in Africa, we have a supreme being, a creator, and we have other divinities who are charged with administering aspects of the supreme being. Somebody, some scholar said it's like a president and the ministers in the cabinet. The president has overall responsibility, but different ministers have specific responsibilities. It's not an exact representation, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to get at. Europeans usually try to disparage African people and say, we have a whole lot of gods. You're poly this and multi that and so on. And they have the identical relationship, which they have borrowed from us. And they're trying to say that that's superior. I think it's important that we understand that. Now, before we move off the question of divinity, I also, or of the, the, the supreme divinity, I mentioned the life force that connects us all. And it seems important for us to look at the lower in um, Vodun, the different divinities, to look at the different divinities or gods, and to recognize that, yes, there are aspects of the supreme being, but also that every created being or thing has a life force in it. And like I said before, this is what connects all beings and things to the creator. That's in our people's understanding of this. Now, the life force is called different things in different languages. But the important thing to do is to recognize its function. And once we recognize its function and its origin, we're going to see that Different people are talking about the same thing. So when somebody says people, the Mbuti people, one of the oldest groups of people in Africa, that's what they're talking about. The ancient Egyptians said Ka, which is a general one, Ba, which is a personalized aspect of that life force. And they talked about the Ak, which is the life force that you get from your ancestors. 
Among the Bantu people, the word is M2. In Yoruba, and as a consequence of Yoruba, in Candomblé, in um, Voodoo and uh, Santiera and various uh, representations of Africa in exile in the Americas. We have Ashe and the various spellings of Ashe, various variations of Ashe, we, we should say. It's the same thing. So the Europeans, the Euro Christians, would say soul. Sometimes they would say mind, body, and soul. What you're talking about there is one or two aspects of nine different aspects of the person that our ancestors in different parts of Africa, and especially in Kemet, detailed, described in their representations of humanity. Before we leave this, let me just say that some Europeans who profess to be Christians actually debated whether African people have souls. Think about that. Some people who inherited this knowledge thousands of years after, and it's my contention, they prostituted that knowledge that they were privileged to have, were actually debating whether the people who discovered this had it. That's tremendous. Now, I mentioned also when we were looking at this slide that Anpu is the divinity that presides over the zone of transition between what we call the living and the dead. Now, that's important because this is an idea that has been taken forward and inherited by different groups of African expressed by different names. Right in Kemet, there is Hathor and Hathor is a divinity that opens the door to rebirth. And I use the term open the door very consciously and deliberately because people who are initiates of Vodun and other African spiritual organizations would understand what I mean. We have Legba. Legba is the divinity of the crossroads. In ancient Egypt, the crossroads was the same meaning, a zone of transition between one state and another one. And in Voodoo, we also have other divinities that perform a crossroads function. Let me just mention here too, that in Kemet, ancient Egypt, it was important to communicate with the people we call the dead. Ancient Egyptians actually wrote letters to the dead. There's a whole category of writing called letters to the dead. If you're studying ancient Egyptian language, you're gonna come upon it. Do you know that African people in the Eastern seaboard islands of the United States. The Gullah or Gishi, some of them actually wrote letters to the dead. I don't know if they understood that they were doing exactly what ancestors thousands of years did. The important thing though, is that the same idea is practiced. And it doesn't matter where we go in the African world, the spirit world is always there, not as represented as it used to be before our people were oppressed, but it's still there. You read the books, the literature books created by African people 
in the Americas. And those books are usually populated by spirits. In Christianity, the idea of the spirit, meaning the spirit of dead people, as we could put it in that way, it's still there, but it's not as fulsome as in African representations of this common inheritance. This is not to say that it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. It's not as represented there. And some people frown upon beliefs in dead, the spirits, in the name of Christianity. Now, I want us to look for a moment on the question of offerings, because this is one of the things that I think we all tend to know about. So it's a point of connection. Simply put, once again, we see offerings coming from deep within Africa and resident in both Vodou and Christianity. Um, let me just say that offerings are many. There are forest fruits, sensing, use of incense, there's libation, there is sacrifice or blood offering. Hey, there, is, there is word offering, which became prayers through a certain process, and there are other forms of offerings. If we go way, way back, deep in the history of Africa, we're going to see that all of these, or most of them anyhow, were once parts of a single integrated ritual. And as time went by and society became more complex, we might argue some of these rituals were separated from each other and became kind of independent rituals in their own right. Forest fruits is usually the celebration of the first and the best that you reap from nature. It's not only fruits, it's if you went on the hunt and so on. You give to the divine and to the ancestors. In Christianity, this is called harvest, but it is thousands of years old in Africa. Sensing the use of incense. It's there in Africa, I'm going to show you some slides in a moment. And it's important we recognize this. Today, as I tell people, if I put on my white robes and go by the roadside and I preach or do anything and I burn incense, most people are going to look at me and say, Kimani walking over But you go to the church, the European church, and you see sensing the burning of incense there, which they inherited it from us, and you don't bat an eyelid. Why is it that when one group of people do something, it's good, and when another group of people do it, the same thing, it's a bad thing? It's a question for us to answer, and it's important for us to discover the reason why. Libation, same thing. We have libation from deep in Africa. We have libation in Voodoo. We have libation in Christianity. If you don't recognize it, well, libation is mentioned in the Bible at least 53 times as drink offering in the singular, and as drink offerings in the plural. It's important we understand this. There is sacrifice or blood offerings. Many people look down upon this nowadays, and I think quite rightly, it's not widely practiced. 
We mentioned prayers before, and there are other forms of offering. Well, here's one of the Nubian pharaohs from the famous 20, is it the 26th, 25th dynasty, who went down into Kemet to restore African order. This guy has two libation bowls, and he's doing a libation. This is Pharaoh Enzo Pepi the first, two libation bowls. Same posture, doing the same thing. Totmos the fault, doing the same thing, almost the same posture. So we could see that this libation was something that was practiced thousands of years ago in Africa or from thousands of years ago. It hasn't been broken. Here we have a father pouring libation. Here we have the same thing happening in Africa, people pouring libation. If you want to go to Kemet, ancient Egypt, this person has sensing. This is incense. Here you have liquid offering. And this person is making this offering to a divinity. Please note that the divinity has what is called the wasp scepter. It's a specialized, um, how you say, a specialized staff, because this is important in, in, in Kemet. And um, the person, this, 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 this pharaoh is actually Men Kepra Ra. Men Kepra Ra is, is his name. Again, this is from the Amarna period. You have Nefertiti and Akhenaten, and they're offering libation. Here we come upon another use of water. Now, water is important in ancient African spirituality. It's important in Wuru, and it's important in Christianity. Fact is, it's important all over Africa. We could speak for hours on the importance of water. Let me just say that Yemanja, uh, Mamiwata, and all of those terms really mean the same thing, mother water, right? Oshun, the owner of the seas or the water. So this question of the significance of water is of the tr tremendous importance in Africa. In African understanding of creation or of the world, the, the, the creation narratives of Africa speak of water at the beginning. In the ancient Egyptian version, before anything started happening, there was Nun, which is a watery substance. And it's out of the Nun that things were created. And ancient Egyptians carried that significance of water with them. And part of the rituals of ascension of each pharaoh was this ceremony that you see being performed here by the divinity, um, Jehuti, and by another important person. And here's what they're doing. They're pouring holy water. You recognize that term? They're pouring holy water on the new Pharaoh. They're baptizing this person in terms that you're more familiar with. I want us to pause to recognize this because immediately you should recognize the significance for bapt of baptism in the Christian religion. 
Now, in Voodoo, there is Kalunga. Kalunga is the same idea of the grand watery mass. And Africans in Haiti reconfigured that watery mass to mean the Atlantic Ocean. And we could escape the oppression of enslavement by exiting that situation through Kalunga and getting back to Guinea or Guinea, which is Africa in a liberated state. So water is tremendously important. And in some versions, some understandings of libation, you only pour it with water or whatever you pour with must be a liquid, of course. And it's related to this sacredness of water. We could spend a lot of time talking about this. You know, humanity is conceived in water. Humanity spends all our time up to the moment of birth, meaning physical birth, in water. 70% of our bodies, water around 70% of the Earth's surface, water. So when our ancestors recognized the significance of water, this is something of profound, you might say today, scientific importance. But I put that forward there, you know. Um, here we have the same ceremony from a different pharaoh. And this, shall we say, is a more recent representation of the same thing, which is not normally associated with its origins deep in Africa. One of the things I mentioned just now is staffs. And I spoke about this one, Heka, which is carried by Jesus, and it announces a pastoral responsibility. The figure we have here is one of the oldest divinities in Kemet. We mentioned this divinity before, Osir. Osir has a flywis, and you could see this flywis among African potentates today and he has the Heka. Heka is a sign and it means a tremendous number of things, including the word hoodoo, from which some people say we get voodoo. But I don't think that etymology is correct. There are all kinds of things significance of significance we could read from this particular figure, but I want to just run on very quickly and show you that Fly whisk and Heka sign, our staff, same thing in other representations of rulership in Kemet. You see it here again. See it here again. There. There. See Heka. Here. And so on. This is a very, very a very early um, representation. Now, here we go with modern African representations of the same thing. I think it's important for us to do this stuff because sometimes, you know, seeing is believing as they say. So you notice the shape of that staff. This one is from Zimbabwe and it has a particular representation and even this bird is significant in its own way. Staff, a more recent one, but it still has that Heka kind of stuff on it. Um, you would recognize this from a certain era in African-American history. Quite apart from the weapon, there's a spear. You could talk about staff there if you wanted to. 
Here is a system. You have that. And you have this particular representation, um, an ANC. Somebody sent me this and I felt it was important, not only because the sister has a staff, but you know what this um, slide talks about. Well, here you have a composite, ancient and more recent. I want you to note that it's not only the staffs, but also the hats that are borrowed here. And again, these are just physical things. There's a lot of ideas, concepts that are borrowed. Now, let me see if I have any other thing that I perhaps, okay, let's, let me make one statement now then, and then throw this open for discussion because we've been at it for a while. What does all of this tell us? Well, for me, there are a number of issues at hand here. One is the way in which African people have used spirituality to fortify ourselves. Even when we don't know the origins of some of the things we attempt to use for spiritual purposes, we can talk about Christianity now. You know, many African people are in the church and do not understand the origins of many of the practices they inherited. And I think it's important to point that out because of the limiting nature of that inheritance upon African people today. It's been infused with European cultural values and it's being used for the purposes of oppression. That's one. I also think that it's important for us to recognize that what we know today as different versions of spirituality has a very, very long history and that it began at the beginning of humanity in Africa. We could explore many specific expressions of parts of this. I mentioned water. I mentioned offerings. I mentioned um, the declarations of innocence. And each one of these, and there are others, could be the subject of extensive investigations. The whole idea of the composition of the human beings as containing a soul and so on is very important. I mean, our understanding of that particular aspect of our inheritance was so lost that Dr. Du Bois in this country had to write a book, The Souls of Black Folk, to prove that our people have soul. Imagine that, because we were so persuaded that we didn't have the very thing that we discovered and first talked about. And we might argue, bequeathed to this world, to other human beings. So this is a matter of the greatest importance. And as we contemplate that, let us also recognize this, that truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it, just let it loose and it will defend itself. Today, people say, so-and-so is blaspheming. You mustn't speak about this. Well, if anything is God's truth, you don't have to defend it. Why are you separating people from anything? If it's the truth, and especially if it's God's truth, it's going to shine through. The fact that people are telling other people that you're blaspheming, you mustn't investigate this and you mustn't do that should be a cause for suspicion. You don't need to protect God's word. God is gonna protect God's word. So truth is like a lion, it shines through. And I pause there 
and wait for questions and comments. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Nehusi. We actually already have some questions coming in for you. Um, the first one is going to be from Imo Odo, a, a formerly known as Zach Brooks, um, a student within our department. I'm going to ask him to go ahead and unmute himself so that he can ask his question. Also, really quick before he starts, if you do have a question, please drop them in the chat um, or send them as a private message to myself. I'm Jasmine Evans, who is the host. Uh, just before, I would just like to raise a question here as to when will I make my response? Yes. Um, thank you, Brother Everett. Um, Jasmine, I think that we have the rapporteur, Dr. Everett Green of Mercy College next on the program. Oh, yeah, apologies, right. you say you were ready for questions. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I, I misled you, so I must take responsibility for that. I do apologize. Go ahead, Dr. Green. Um, well, I would like to express uh, my profound thanks to uh, Dr. Kimani Mihushi for his um, insightful and um, um, very important presentation and um, uh, much work to be done and uh, time is almost, <laughs> there's not, I will have to be very brief because um, there are a number of things that we would have to spend maybe a whole uh, six months, at least twice a week just to discuss here. Um, but let me start out by uh, recognizing um, a profound uh, truth that you have made in terms of the, um, the nature of African spirituality and its universality, and the fact that uh, um, the very word religion is foreign to African people, that their, um, the whole, I would, what we call indigenous sacred ways, or the sacred way spirituality of African people, and uh, uh, the important connection that you have made in terms of, um, the, uh, the sacred ways of Africa and the question of the environment. And we can say without contradiction that um, uh, indigenous people, African people, and ind indigenous people in general were the first uh, environmentalists, were the first ecologists. And uh, you raised that important matter which especially uh, today, when we are um, at the uh, very tipping point of human existence and the possibility of annihilation. Uh, now let's um, let's we let's see if we can. I, I just want to raise something. Uh, somebody's cut, cutting in here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the question of um, uh, of avudon and uh, as it's practiced today, and um, its emergence through um, what I would call um, ethnic cleansing and cultural genocide and how it has been transformed in relationship with his, with his um, its intent for survival vis-a-vis -vis the imperial religion of Christianity. And that would, uh, that's a whole other discussion that maybe uh, we can come back to at some other time. I just raise it now. And, um, um, the, 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 the spiritual ways 
of Africa. That's another question I'm laying out here. Don't expect it to be discussed today in any length, the whole question of the spiritual ways of Africa. It's um, original practice and uh, how and its um, um, development to its influence through an imperial religion of Christianity, because this is uh, highly contested today uh, in terms of um, uh, seeing, for instance, the whole question of a supreme God, whether there were any such in Africa in its original practice before Western scholars thought uh, um, start to, because of their education and their development uh, and their whole, um, uh, what one could call uh, their, their colonial religion. And so start to find the supreme being in Africa. Uh, from MBT and others, a brilliant scholar, um, <clears throat> What is um, the take have discussed that in detail and uh, something that we, we might want to uh, consult. Um, now, the next question here is that, uh, let's go to uh, Christianity uh, because uh, Christianity is a highly speculative religion as it emerged. And it's emerged in the midst of um, a bloody political and theological struggle. And so um, how these doctrine developed over time and its uh, contestation uh, in relationship to um, Gregor Roman worldview and uh, the whole question of the philosophy coming out of the uh, Gregor Roman world. And so it's a highly speculative religion. And uh, so there is some question about its relationship uh, to African concept, religion, and uh, the rest of it. Um, and so there is this problematic with scholars uh, in, the, in the understanding of um, the indigenous spirituality of Africa. And uh, the um, the imperial religion of Christianity. And um, um, the next question, the next query has to do with the, that uh, which wing of Christianity are we really talking about since there are different wings there and different practices. Uh, you also mentioned that Christianity is, um, um, is primarily male in its orientation. And uh, I would suggest uh, that is the wing, that is the orthodox wing of Christianity that we would find in uh, whether it is Catholicism, uh, Protestantism, or uh, Greek Orthodox Church or Eastern Orthodox. There is this, um, uh, what I would say, uh, Christianity emerge as, um, um, taxis in, in, in the situation of a taxic masculinity as it emerged uh, from Greek uh, Gregor Roman culture and primarily with its um, uh, fascination, obsession with the perfection of the male body. And, uh, and so the whole uh, that, that uh, Christos, that Christ is coming out of that situation there. Now there is the other wing. There is one of, of, uh, of, I would say five, six, seven different wings. There is a Gnostic wing of Christianity in which the, the, um, the female is the essential, the whole uh, question in Gnostic Christianity that it is Eve who is the, 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 the mother of the creative process and uh, uh, raised up Adam from his, um, you know, feeble state. And so there is that wing of Christianity, which indeed um, 
today has been taken over by, uh, what should I say, adventurers economically and otherwise, because there are all these books now associate uh, Voudon with Gnostic Christianity. And uh, uh, Voudon is this, uh, that's from where um, that uh, Gnostic Christian relation to the uh, traditional African practice. And so they are now cashing in on Voudon by writing books uh, the relationship between Wudon and Gnostic, and Gnostic Christianity, which emphasize the uh, the female principle. Um, and uh, let me go five minutes and I'll have to stop because uh, there, are, there are so many things I would want to raise, but let me raise uh, one or two other things um, about um, the whole, um, The whole question of the, the examination of the Christian doctrine and see if there is any equivalent in Africa. And you, you mentioned the Trinity there, but uh, 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 the whole question uh, how it is how it emerged in, uh, out of um, the, the Gregor Roman worldview, um, uh, the doctrine of sin is the equivalent in, in, in African. Um, religious practice of the uh, doctrine of sin as it emerged in, 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 in Christianity. Uh, uh, you mentioned the eschatology, um, uh, but, but, but um, the whole question of the, uh, the doctrine of the devil, uh, which uh, I would contest is primarily coming out of the, uh, the Persian worldview and uh, Zoroastrianism and its duality, that radical dualism in Christianity is in Africa uh, there. Uh, so we could spend a whole time about this radical dualism within Christianity as it practiced. Um, the, let me stop there because I, I need to allow other people to have to, to ask question and um, I can come back to a, a number of other things that I would like to raise. But the final one, I, I would say that um, actually the mythology about uh, the Christos, the Christ, um, so is not, um, uh, if it is that mythology is taken seriously, it could not be Jewish. And so Christianity, um, Christianity is a radical, in some sense, religion from Judaism. and. Uh, and you have mentioned uh, uh, something about that, but uh, uh, Christianity, uh, uh, Christianity is a Greco-Roman religion, and uh, um, if you look at where you, if you want to find out in detail about the Christian religion, the essence of Christianity, it is in that uh, it is a letter to the Romans, and uh, um, supposed to be written by a guy named Paul that we are not sure about if it's actually written by him. Uh, but uh, uh, Christianity, uh, Jesus could not be a Jew. Uh, sorry, uh, Jesus is a Jew and could not have been a Christian in any um, kind of uh, uh, theological uh, sense of the word. I'm going to stop here and um, um, I will give people heal the four because we don't have much time. All right. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Green, for highlighting those questions. And you know, I'm really glad that I said that this thing is so big <laughs> that we can't get to the bottom of it all. But I think that the interest in this and the number of points raised so far, and this is just the beginning of the question period, does indeed um, reflect the profound importance of this, as well as the great interest people have in it. Um, I don't know what this means for the hosting uh, parties, but it's something that I think we should reflect upon. Let me just quickly say that a big part of the answer to most of your queries 
seems to me to be the fact that Western Europeans have attempted and succeeded substantially in taking this doctrine and relocating it into their own cultural sphere for their own political and other kinds of purposes. And I think that this is seen when you notice how the doctrine has been bent and shaped to carry European cultural values. Male dominance is particularly significant in this respect. Male dominance is an Indo-European cultural characteristic. And like you correctly pointed out, there are aspects of Christianity that survived with equality of women. Mm -hmm. And this Gnostic wing was put to the sword mm -hmm. by the dominant wing of Christianity right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was brutal. Mm -hmm. There were forms of the Inquisition that was let loose on those people mm -hmm. because of their belief. And I think that in our attempts to understand Christianity, we need to understand not only the viciousness of these attacks, these ungodly attacks, I should say, upon those believers, but also of the tremendous courage and spirit and faith of some of those believers who continued to practice what they believe. Now we could speak for hours as we both said on this. How about the Inquisition in the Iberian Peninsula with the conversus? Mm -hmm. Jews who were compelled on the pain of death to convert to Christianity and then they were expelled. Then Ferdinand and Isabella came to the throne. Now this is an entire history that again, we can't even go into. So yes, I agree with you. And I think that the answer is the way in which groups of European rulers have reduced Christianity to what you call an imperial religion. And they used it for political control inside their own territories also. Later on, they would extend that kind of barbarism to lands that they conquered with the sword, claiming that they were doing this in the name of God. I think also that we should spend a moment responding to your query about sin. And I think you've located that notion of sin quite correctly. It's not part of the African spiritual inheritance. I mean, it's profoundly... Well, I had another word, but let me just say disappointing that people who claim that God is a good God would allow his creations to be born in sin. There is something profoundly, not merely contradictory, but disturbing in that notion that humanity is born in sin, created by a good God. I would just leave that there. You know, we just, we just need to see these vulgarities and understand that ungodly people have found ways of imposing themselves and their thoughts in something that was meant to be quite different. The whole question of duality, again, it's a limiting and limited understanding of our people's recognition that very often you need to have balance. There was complementarity, difference, but complementarity. And we could go deeper into this. Mm -hmm. I'm always, uh, I always believed and sometimes recognize that there's a danger in talking about duality because it doesn't reflect the full complexity of our people's understanding. It was really inclusion, you know? Um, duality tends to reduce 
the reality to two com competing opposites. This is the binary opposition thought of Europe. And our people didn't subscribe to that. And the whole question of good, bad, you know, that there's a struggle going on between people who are all good and another group of people who are all bad. That's pure primitive reductionism. You see it around us today. There's a conflict in the Ukraine. And suddenly, the guy who is the leader of one country in that conflict, everything about him is bad and everything about his country is bad. And I wonder if these people who are adults ever stop to think about how stupid and harmful that kind of press could be. But this is the kind of thinking that has dominated Western Europe for quite a number of years now, over 600 years and even before then. So this, this, this notion of the devil is again defective. Let's go to Kemet, ancient Egypt, which is one of the clearest and detailed expressions of this question that we have in African tradition. And we're going to see that CTEC or SET was a representation of chaos, of discordance. But CTEC or SET wasn't completely and totally discordant or sinful or would say have a negative or um, vibes you might want to put. CTEC was discordant. And CTEC was there to warn people, hey, you gotta be on your toes, careful here, you know? So although there are bad people and bad things and bad actions, in our people's conceptualization of reality, no person was all good or all bad. We were all striving to be better human beings. And that's the point about these doctrines. You've got to strive to be better. So again, the notion of the devil and so on, if there is a devil, the devil is there to represent what is unwholesome. And we should recognize that all of us sometimes make errors, we do wrong things. Sometimes we, we, we just bloody minded, as some people say. Sometimes we do it in what you could call genuine error. You don't know better or you believe something different and so on. But we must acknowledge and try to be better. And I think that's the point of our ancestors' uh, understanding of these things. So I would, I would um, leave my response to, to you there, um, if it's okay with you, uh, Brother Everett. And <laughs> Sorry? Fine with me, because uh, too much to cover. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and I know that there are people waiting to ask their questions. So I'm going back to Sister Cindy. The chair has gone out on us. We're not hearing you, Sister Cindy. Would you like me to read the, the next question, Jumani? Okay. Oh, she's back. Yeah. Hold on. Yes, Jasmine, you were taking care of the questions, I believe. Yes, that's not a problem. Um, as I was saying before, our first question comes from Emo Odo formerly known as Zach Brooks, um, a student within the Department of Africology at Temple University. Um, Imo, are you still here? I don't think he is. Um, so if you are here, please send me a message. 
Um, but if not, we're going to go ahead um, and move on to our other questions. We have another question from Brenda Edwards. She says, a question for Dr. Nehusi, is it considered a form of worship or just praise when we communicate with the ancestors? I think the form of communication is important, but I would make a distinction between worship and adoration, praise, uplifting, and so on. Um, generally, you worship divinities and you adore or praise ancestors, although on very few occasions, ancestors could become divine. For example, in Kemet, there was Imhotep. In Yoruba, there is Shongo. And of course, there are others. So that would be my response. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Medino Abraham. I, pro I apologize if I mispronounced your name, but he said hello, or they said hello. I am enjoying the presentation. I would like to know if African spirituality is um, uh, sorry, homogeneous, or are there minority differences among them? Example, one dominant group prevails or promotes its spirituality over the others as the standard one. Thanks for that question. The African practice, traditional practice, was that people could believe what they want. If the, um, their differences and the differences are so profound, then you could go somewhere else and set up. This is the notion of the Exodus as it occurs or would be represented or misrepresented in the Bible. African people didn't traditionally impose their beliefs upon other people, but you were socialized into certain um, values. Now, I will argue that in more recent times, groups of African people have attempted to impose their beliefs upon others that they have physically conquered. But it's not the African traditional way. I hope that that kind of generalized answer without going into very specifics is sufficient. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Sister Queen. She says, um, greetings, and this is an important conversation here. Um, my question is, what do you suggest that African people should do who have already been baptized in water? Thanks, Sister Queen, for that question. I have to assume that you mean African people who are trying to find out more about our own traditions and have been baptized in a Christian um, religion or something like that. I don't think that being baptized imposes any kind of prison upon you. Um, I think that many of us are genuinely searching for ways forward. And I also believe that many of the people who inhabit the churches are genuine in their own misunderstanding of things, if I might put it that way. And I think this kind of conversation is important among all of us so that we could begin to understand our past and the practices that are affecting us today in ways that are liberating. And the, the important thing is always going to be this. If you find out that something is bad or wrong or limiting, disadvantageous to you in any way, leave that thing behind. Many of us are mentally imprisoned because we're told all kinds of frightening things. And we begin our interaction with matters of spirituality and faith and the church in a mental prison that tells us that you must believe this belief. And we carry belief. And in the face of facts that contradict those beliefs, we dig our heels in and say, this is my faith, this is my religion, this is my God, and so on. 
and believe that we are being strong in our ignorance. Nobody's strong in ignorance. You're liberated by the facts, by knowledge, by new understandings of things. And there are times when you have to challenge yourself to grow, to change, to become better. And this is the supreme way of becoming better by adopting newer and better ideas or different ones anyhow. So I hope that that's uh, an adequate response to Sister Queen. Yes, thank you. Um, as we're nearing the two hour mark, um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this says, good day and thank you for your presentation. My question to Professor Kamani, in your opinion, why is there a constant preoccupation amongst Europeans to ascribe labels and categories of dead entities, i.e. having no soul and, having, and not having a philosophy upon African people? And that is from Aminette Hall. Again, apologies if I mispronounced your name. Sister Aminette, greetings. Thank you for your question. Um, the, 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 the answer to your question is simply that uh, Europeans who went to Africa for bad purposes, to rape and steal and enslave, to do the greatest crimes in human history against African people, could not tell the world or admit to themselves that they were doing these deadly things, ungodly things to innocent people. They had to pretend that African people didn't have civilization, didn't have soul, didn't have anything good. I mean, they were going to the continent that created Christianity to say that they're bringing Christianity to African people. They were going to the continent that initiated civilization to say they're civilizing us. And some of us believe that racist nonsense so they, they, their labeling of us in these pathological ways, and they're consistently pathological in the labeling of us and things about us, tells us not who we are, but who they are. And I would leave it there. Two more questions, you said? Um, Hour and a half, we're approaching. Um, we are approaching um, five o'clock, um, but if you have time for a couple more questions, we can do that. I certainly do have the time. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Let me look here. Um, it says, um, how do you see Haiti and what does it represent in the present world order? How you see what, what it is presently going through, how do you see it emerging? And that is from Martha Dulcime. Again, apologies for the uh, um, mispronunciation. Mirta Dulcime. I thought it was Dulcime. Thank Désolé. you very much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, sister. Um, I don't think I could answer the last part of your question because of two reasons. One, I think. Nobody could be prescriptive, could be so exact in predicting what's going to happen. And secondly, I think substantially, it's up to the Haitian people with the help of allies, including those of us who feel that way, should be the ones to determine the final shape of what's happening. But I'm very, very confident in the answers to the other part of your question. And Haiti is first and foremost, a shining example of African resistance to European oppression. Let us recall that the people of Haiti employed African spirituality in the form of voodoo to wage a war of military liberation against European armies, let's count them. One was sent by the British. The British at that point in time were the second most 
powerful military nation in the world. They would overtake the French in that status at the Battle of Waterloo a couple of years after. Two armies of the French were defeated. The France under Napoleon Bonaparte was the foremost military power in the world at that point in time. He sent an army under his own brother-in-law, Rochambeau, and that army was defeated also. An army of the Spanish was defeated. An army of local whites and mulattoes were defeated. We have the spectacle of a group of African people who started out being untrained in the military arts, defeating five European armies. Let's think about that. The magnitude of that feat of arms, African feat of arms, is as though an army of which country? Let's take Jamaica, took on the United States Army twice and defeated it. Then took on, which is the next biggest country we talk about in terms of military, Russia? Yeah, defeated Russia. You know, this is, this is the tremendous significance of the achievement of Asian people at arms. And we generally don't know this. And there's a reason for us not knowing it usually, because it's not in the interest of the oppressors of Haitian people, who are the oppressors of African people everywhere, for that fact to be known. Because if we know that and we understand it, we'll recognize the tremendous importance of voodoo. So that is part of what Haiti represents to me. IT also represents the way in which Europeans oppress people who pose a threat to their dominance. It's no insignificant fact that IT is so impoverished and oppressed today. It, the country was deliberately impoverished. Imagine the French and other Europeans who talk about liberty and freedom, the French imposed a fine of millions of dollars, billions of dollars upon 80. You know what it was for? Their so-called property in human beings that liberated themselves. And the other European powers, the United States, Britain, um, Germany, all of them supported the French in that ungodly and unjust demand upon the Haitian people. That's part of the explanation of the poverty of IT. And we could go in and on and on about American invasion and that kind of thing. So IT represents those things for me and it should for all of us. And that's why when in the Caribbean, people from IT are mistreated we must recognize that it is the best in us that are being mistreated. And we, have, we should have no compulsion in joining together to working with people from IT to improve the lot of all of us. That's a shining example of our achievement. And the fact that other people wanted it different is what's displayed in front of our eyes every time we recognize the oppression of the people of IT. In liberating or helping them to liberate themselves from the current oppression, we're liberating ourselves also. In liberating the knowledge of voodoo and what it is being used for, the revolutionary purposes, we are liberating ourselves too. I will stop there. Okay, we have another question. It says, what are the elements which differ between spirituality and religion? It's simple. Spirituality recognizes a connection or the connections of everything with everything else, the interconnected universe. That's where we get environmentalism from. We know that if we shoot all the bison, in America, something bad is going to happen. This is a historical example. African people don't believe, behave in that way. 
if you're going to hunt, you don't see 10 deer and attempt to shoot all 20 of them. You take what is necessary. You start out by making the profoundest promise to the divinity concerned that you're only going to take what you want. Our relationship with the environment was regulated by need, not by greed. That is spirituality in daily practice. Religion has somebody at the head of it that tells you what you must do. You've got to follow these rules. The church says this. Look at the Catholic religion today. A set of men telling everybody, including women, what they must do and how they must do it. Our people didn't practice that kind of hierarchical domination of one group of people over the other. I'm not arguing for a lack of organization. However, we articulate organization in our um, communities. And I'm recognizing that sometimes you might have some kind of hierarchical arrangement. But what I'm saying is that religion has turned out for the longest while to be these kinds of things. The popes were involved in murder, warfare. I mean, you just name it, you know? And that's part of the history of the church, the European church, I might say. So, you know, um, to me, spirituality is something far more profound and religion is something that's far more limited in all of these ways. Thank you. Um, our next question says, um, blessings, Professor Kamani. Do you think an apostasy action can be a way for Buddhists to disassociate from the confusions? Um, and in parentheses, they said requests to get out of the Catholic registers. I, I'm, 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 I'm not certain I understand that question and I don't know how germane it is. So a discussion on the African spirituality as a common origin of Vodun and European Christianity to talk about Buddhism and Confucianism. Um, maybe there's a link that's implied there that I don't know about, but I, I'm really sorry that I don't think that I'm armed with any knowledge to answer that question. Certainly not that I'm aware of. Understandable. Um, it looks like we have one last question. It says, does Black theology embrace African spirituality? I'm not very confident that I understand what Black theology is referred to, but I know that people have changed and so on. But, you know, um, I saw that the foundation of what is called Black theology in this country was certain doctrines in Luke and uh, Mark, I think. But it was the doctrine of helping other people. You know, the grand statement of this is, of course, the um, parable of the Good Samaritan. And, you know, in those doctrines, you're talking about going to help the sick and um, going to prison to visit people, unfortunate people. And I think that that's an extremely important thing to do. But what disappointed me and still does about that doctrine is that the people who articulate it do not appear to understand where it comes from. The whole idea of doing God is encountered in the world's literature our moral reasoning in Kemet in ancient Egypt. I'm not going to resist the notion that it was in Africa before. But could you please mute that person? But you know, in Kemet, as soon as people started writing, you saw them saying things like, I gave a boat to the boatness, food to the hungry close to the naked. And these same statements would reappear in the Bible. And then they would be extended in ways that I mentioned before. 
So the root of that black theology is in African spirituality, but the framers of that black theology don't know their own history, their own cultural history. So they're reading from a book that's written substantially by other people for purposes of enslaving them themselves. And in a way, this is a beautiful question because it highlights the importance of us knowing who we are, knowing our history. So we return to where we started, to the words of our ancestors. The beginning of wisdom is knowing who you are. And if you know the beginning well, the end will not trouble you. I hope that we are not troubled by this ending. Uh, Brother Kimani, uh, could I say something? Just a word yes, about sir. black theology? Because um, just like um, a big section of liberation theology, uh, they're all used to neutralize uh, uh, African people striving uh, in the Americas. And so they, they were based on the same premise of, um, of uh, Christocentric, of European Christocentric theology. And um, it was used even by <clears throat> part of the whole uh, Cointel Pro as a way of neutralizing uh, the, the striving, and especially in the Americas where liberation theology really and truly neutralize uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the whole um, development there that was uh, against the oppressive imperial uh, coming out of the U United States. And as a matter of fact, there were priests who uh, were agents of the CIA in uh, some of these, um, uh, you know, so-called black theology and religious movements. So we have to be very careful. Uh, and uh, it is a continuous process of neutralization. They always find a group uh, to neutralize and um, the, the genuine striving and uh, uh, militancy of uh, African people there. It's uh, if you want, maybe the Black Panther Path, it would be a more <laughs> a progressive way of looking at uh, uh, the, the striving of African people in, in the Americas. Well, um, I, I thank you for that contribution, Brother Everett. And it comes back to something you said, imperial religion. You know, religion was subverted. So, the imperial purposes, the political purposes of the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the American Empire, nothing is sacred for these people. So they use everything to get their own political purposes. And that's usually narrow and damaging to quite a number of people. Uh, Professor Kahani, uh, no, since Emerita's hand is up, I wonder if she could be allowed Sorry? to speak. Sister Mirta Dazzle would like to ask a question. Or oh, please comment. go ahead, sister. Yes, um, well, first, thank you for your life transforming lecture, which was just really amazing. Um, so I wanted to ask you, in, after these five centuries of vicious repression of African culture by the imperial um, powers, do you see the 21st century as a century when Africans um, come back, you know, regain their rightful place um, 
in the world order and how do you see, what is your view on the reparations uh, movement? Well, thanks. First, first part of the question for us. Um, I, I see an increasingly bright future for African people because we're beginning to rearm ourselves with ancestral knowledge. More and more people in our communities, as well as other people too, white people, are beginning to investigate the truth and uncover facts, information that contradict the lies of centuries of European um, exploitation and oppression. And to me, this announces a qualitative difference between this generation of African freedom fighters and previous generations. Today, we know more about ourselves as a group of people. We're investigating matters like we've been discussing today. And we've all agreed, or some of us who spoke have agreed that, you know, this is only a very, very small, limited discussion on this matter. There's a whole lot more to be talked about on this subject. And more and more people are understanding this. And I believe that the observation I quoted by our ancestors is of the tremendous importance. If you know who you are, nobody, nobody could make you the fool that many of us have been made by people who call themselves Christians. You know, in, in, in different parts of Africa today, people are busy destroying artifacts that they inherited from their ancestors, calling these things devil. They're busy disparaging doctrines that liberate them. They say they come from the devil because devils told them that they come from the devil. One European writer said that the best trick the devil ever played was to say that he doesn't exist. And we need to be very careful to understand these things. So yes, I believe that we are going in the correct direction. And it is in this connection that I am very pleased that you articulated the notion of reparations. You know, in the early 90s, I was involved in what I choose to call the beginning of this new wave of reparations. And lots of work was done in different parts of Europe, in England, in the United States and so on. And today, Reparations keep coming back to me in ways that are pleasing. People are talking about repairing ourselves. And this is what reparations mean. Reparations for me, substantially means us taking back ourselves, our minds, our knowledge from our oppressors. Oh well, yes, I would like to get the trillions that they owe us. Make no mistake about that. But let me tell you this, one of the cleverest things our oppressors could do today is to call all those plantation managers they've installed, we call them presidents and prime ministers of Africa and elsewhere, and say, hey, please sign on this line, take this three trillion or how much money we owe you as a final settlement. They could be confident in the knowledge that before they go to bed and wake up, at least half of that money will be back in Western banks. Simply put, our people do not have the knowledge, the orientation, and the organization to take care of our own business at this moment in time. We will only get there when we liberate our minds or enough of us liberate our minds. You can't have African redemption without African mental liberation. 
You can't have African development without the liberation of our minds. The profoundest way in which we have been imprisoned, dishonored, is through mental enslavement. So the beginning, the most important step we could make in our own liberation is freeing our minds. That's why we have Africology that's practiced in our department and other schools, where we look at African phenomena from the points of view, the perspectives, if you wish, of African people. We are agents in our own stories. We've restored centrality, agency to ourselves. We do things in our own names for our own purposes. That's liberation. And this is a movement that is beginning to become more and more weighty in our own affairs. And this is the ultimate meaning of reparations. So yes, I see the 21st century as a moment of increasing liberation, because for me, liberation is a process. It's not an event. It's not something that will happen one day. We're doing liberation right now. We're doing reparations right now because we're talking about ways in which we understand ourselves better. Hopefully this will lead to greater liberation of our minds. And once we're doing that, we're no longer on a byway. We're on a highway to liberation. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Nehisi, for those insightful remarks. I think it was a very robust discussion on today. Thank you, Ms. Evans, for really navigating the question and answer section. That was great. I think um, we've learned a lot on today. I will now turn it over to the thanks section of this, because we've been here for a while this afternoon, but it's a necessary conversation, as been previously said, that we're going to be here. We could be here for another you know, extensive discussion all day, all night, all week, all month, to really, you know, dive in to the innermost parts of our spiritual journey as a civilization. So we, I will turn it over now to the head of the Department of Language and Cultural Studies from the University of Guyana, Andrew Kendall. Hi, and sorry, before I turn it over, Sorry, before I turn it over to, to um, Andrew Kendall, I wanted to also thank our translators, Kevin Anglade, Jean Alexandre, and Raphael Ara, because they were doing a fantastic job. It was an, a long two and a half hours of um, you know, robust discussion. So thank you for your contributions as well. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I'm afraid, folks, that uh, Mr. Kendall was unable to come because of his computer woes and he's living a bit, uh, a good distance away from where I am now. But he did send something which I would like to read. But I'm going to take the opportunity now to stick in something of my own. Um, one of the most painful experiences I've had in the last two years, um, actually since 2017, was to watch, witness firsthand the treatment of Haitian migrants by the Guyanese immigration authorities. I'm not saying that they exclusively treated Haitians that way. Maybe it's something in their, their very nature that makes them oriented towards human beings in the way those people were treated. And I remember one particular Haitian migrant who I had embraced and brought into my home. And I remember actually nursing his feet after we got him a job on a farm, nursing his feet back into health because they were all bruised and torn from the work he was doing on the farm. 
And since then, we have developed the Haiti Support Group, which has grown in strength, but not nearly any kind of strength that can offer the kind of help to Haitian migrants today. And this particular forum came out of a very vicious uh, debate that happened between Haitians. I would say it did not even rise to the level of a debate. It was a, a confused argument about the, 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 the evils of Vodun versus the, the good of Christianity. And Professor Nihusi, listening to me explain this to, to, to him, decided that this forum had to happen. And from what I'm hearing, it seems as though this is just the beginning of a, a new conversation, following upon many, many conversations over the past few centuries, a new conversation to take the relation of Caribbean people to a different level. Um, so, I will slide right into Mr. Kendall's vote of thanks now and turn it back over to you, Cindy. He says, Ngogi Wathiongo's decolonizing the mind has endured as a landmark anti-colonial treaties that speaks to the relationship between language and colonialism. Although his writing has been examined through the linguistic power of language and ideology, it is not just the structural aspects of language that demand our scrutiny, but the cultural and connotative significance of language. How do the ways we perceive things in our culture affect the ways that we engage with them? Today's venture has been an essential, intentional push towards an intentional reassessment of how we engage with the culture around us the language of description and analysis that is provided to these aspects of culture and history, and the importance of rewriting and rewriting our relationship with research and cultural practices, particularly in this forum, assessing African spirituality and the common roots of existence between Wotan and European Christianity. Harmful perceptions of indigenous Africa and indigenous African trends still affect us in co contemporary society. And events like these offer valuable and crucial course correction, providing valuable perspectives on the past, the present, and the future. Thank you to the organizers of the event for their tenacity and commitment to disseminating information as they work towards bringing their research to the public eye and using the possibilities of our digital landscape to reach a wide range of persons from around the world. This kind of venture offers constructive pathways that recognize the relationship between the academic and the non-academic in public facing events like this that put effort into recognizing, safeguarding, and refocusing the attention on cultural heritage and heritage-based research. I think that was a suitable academic ending. Thank you very much, Cindy. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for staying. Thank you very much. I believe Brother Kwame wanted to say a word of thanks as well. Is he still yes. there? Yes, greetings everyone. And again, just to echo the sentiments that were shared before, and you know, um, Brother Nehusi's um, yeoman service this afternoon, you know, uh, and uh, for, for those many hours of, of deep thought and, and an issue that, that uh, takes energy, you know, to, to speak to this very challenging time, dealing with the crimes against us uh, uh, in, the, in this ongoing sojourn to reclaim our humanity. And not a, um, or, or, or to, 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 to defend against those who would attempt to destroy it. So I want to salute everyone. And, and uh, you know, those organizations that you mentioned, uh, Cindy and, and uh, Dr. Wilkinson, you know, the Haitian Cultural Society, the Federation of Caribbean Cultural Associations, uh, and of course, you know, us Caribbean Progressive Perspectives, but also the Africa Studies Research Group at the University of Guyana, and the Department of Africology and African-American studies at Temple, you know, uh, 
stellar contributions to, to the liberation of our people. And, uh, you know, in no small part, you know, we're doing this both in honoring our ancestors, the terror visit upon them, and to the promise of a new future for future generations. Hopefully, we can offer to our children and grandchildren a space of integrity and a space that's been restored. So I want to thank everyone for this sacred journey uh, this afternoon as we carry on. Thank you, Cindy, for your uh, hosting. Well, that is, we're coming to the end of this very insightful and enlightening session. Look forward to more information on various topics in regards to our liberation, our enlightenment, our solution-oriented um, approach to looking at our world and our communities, especially you know, our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, how we can from on this side you know, offer an extension of assistance and how we can learn from them as well. Because um, innovation, I would say, comes from the South. Anyway, all the best. Have a great rest of your day or evening. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Sister Cindy. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you, Professor Neuzi. Thank you, Mr. Green. And thank you, Sister Charlene Wilkinson and all the organizers. Yes. Thank Mr. you Williams. very much, Sister Martha. Thank you. <laughs> Sad passé? <laughs> La boule. <laughs> <laughs> Merci, 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 merci. <laughs>